Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the, uh, this webinar series co-hosted by ET Retail and Winkler. I, I have with me Niket, joining in from uh, Noida, from the ET office itself. And uh, I have uh, Ravi joining in on phone from Bangalore. So uh, I'll quickly start off with a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I started Winkulam uh, about nine years back. Winkulam is uh, in the business of uh, enabling multi-channel retailing. So we, uh, if you, uh, I'll spend half a minute just introducing the company and we'll take it from there. So Winkulam essentially helps all the players selling online. Uh, like sellers on marketplaces, uh, retailers who are pure online brands, retailers uh, who are brick and mortar retailers looking at moving online strategically, uh, and CPG companies who are also, there's a trend of uh, CPG companies moving online. So we, we work with each of uh, these players in terms of uh, a set of software solutions. So we are a software company. Uh, Essentially, if we look at uh, the primary focus of the company, we are building integrations to marketplaces, building integrations to all the fulfillment companies in different uh, geographies like India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, US. And uh, through this integration layer, which is quite powerful, what we are enabling is for companies who whoever is selling online to um, sell domestically and also to sell internationally. So we are, which is uh, through, we are facilitating this through a set of uh, SaaS-based solutions for order management, fulfillment, cataloging, and onboarding sellers. So uh, without uh, much ado, I'll introduce uh, the uh, uh, co-panelists who are, who are there today in this webinar. Uh, Mr. Raviraj Rodriguez, who is the supply chain head of uh, Wildcraft. Ravi, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and Wildcraft? Yes. Uh... Hi, today uh, I would be representing the retailing community and I plan to share with you my experiences in Wildcraft journey from offline to offline plus online. Uh, my past experience as you can see from my profile has largely been in supply chain. However, I am very passionate about creating an omni-channel presence for the customer. And during my stint in Wildcraft, I have spent a lot of time trying to work on processes to bring about that transformation. Wildcraft, as you know, is one of India's leading brands in the auto segment. We are proud of our Made in India tag, and we manufacture high-quality, affordable products in India, and retail them to 3,000 plus passes in India, that is points of sale in India. And in fact, we've also gone recently gone global. We are now retailing in six countries, mostly in the Middle East, Malaysia, and Indonesia. We've also started selling into US markets through Amazon. Uh, that's all about me for now, and I will uh, talk more about what Wildcraft uh, has been doing on this transformation in uh, subsequently. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, I'll also invite Niket to introduce himself and introduce Alexa to the audience. Uh, thanks, Venkat. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, I take care of product at Tolexo. So uh, Tolexo is a B2B e-commerce uh, site, you know, with the vision to have a one-stop solution for all the MRO and industrial needs for all SMEs and MSMEs, retailers, dealers spread across India. We are backed by India Mart uh, and uh, we house more than a million products, uh, you know, across multiple categories. Uh, you know, we, we have more than 8,000 brands which are national, international, you know, we are bringing local uh, and, you know, brands and taking them national. We are, uh, you know, uh, we have more than 7,000 sellers uh, with us, you know, who are helping us, uh, you know, achieve our vision. I hope to share some experiences that we have in building Colexo and see if we can assist uh, everyone there to, you know, how to bring the journey from online to offline and then offline to online. Thank you. Thanks again. So, uh, I'd like to set the agenda for the discussion today. So, we, we're going to start off with uh, defining O2O and how to get the best of both online and offline worlds. So we will start with the CO2 uh, um, omni-channel. These words have been used and um, the definitions have been very different. Uh, people, uh, every, there's no consistent uh, definition which has been used. So uh, uh, we will set that context first. In terms of the way we are looking at O2O is uh, there, there's a clear trend of the brick and mortar retailers moving from offline to online. and uh, 
we we there are, um, this is particularly required because of the changing expectations of the customer. So customers today are more savvy. They expect a lot of convenience in terms of shopping, and uh, marketplaces have come in and made a lot of uh, changes in terms of uh, expectations on same day delivery or near same day delivery. We are, we're going to look at uh, uh, the impact of all this um, in terms of how retailers are uh, looking at online more strategically. At the same time, uh, people selling online like marketplaces and uh, pure online brands, they recognize that uh, the touch with the customer is absolutely important. So offline to online is one part of the O2O journey, but we are also seeing that online players are setting up small stores, setting up kiosks, uh, they are collaborating with retailers to uh, create uh, experience uh, for the customers so that they touch and feel the products before they buy. So you are seeing the online players who are moving offline. So uh, we are going to look at uh, different use cases there. So that is the next part of uh, what we are going to cover uh, in terms of the whole O2O transformation. And we are also going to look at uh, the whole um, consistent experience which is being provided to the customer. So. Uh, following that, we will go do a deep dive into Wildcraft and Tel Telexo in terms of their own experiences. So the use cases are uh, some of the uh, good examples in the industry. Uh, post that, we will look at what is the impact in terms of uh, technology uh, changes which are required and what investments need to be made. What is the impact towards process and training? So we will touch upon that. Because of course, it's a it's very ambitious looking at an agenda like this to cover within 30, 35 minutes, but we will try to do what we can. And out of this, we would, uh, out of the experience uh, of uh, the uh, esteemed panelists whom we have today in the webinar, so we hope to get you a cheat sheet to succeed. So this would be for all parts of the uh, ecosystem. We would, we would uh, take up examples for sellers, for online brands, for retailers, and uh, for marketplaces to see how they can succeed in this whole O2O -O journey. So um, just a quick uh, look at this. If you look at uh, offline to online, so uh, I did touch upon this. So uh, retailers are looking at uh, um, going online A as an additional sales channel. They're, they're also looking at uh, uh, building customer loyalty as a key critical factor. Also through going online, uh, many retailers are identifying new customer bases as well. So we will touch upon each of these through the use cases. And uh, online to offline like I covered, uh, the marketplaces and online brands, they are setting up small stores and kiosks to, and collaborating with the retailers. So we will we'll, uh, jump into some of the customer expectations. Today's customers, when we look at them, um, customers are saying, give me information. I, mean, I, would like to do, I would like to look up inventory before I shop. I mean, if I want to buy a Nike orange shoe size 12, I want to know it's available in the store before I actually, um, before I actually visit the store. Now, uh, I don't want to go to the store and find that the product that I'm looking for is not available. So that's the uh, that's one expectation. Uh, the second expectation is that if I uh, if uh, if I go to the store and I don't find the product, uh, the sales associate should be able to uh, close the deal by either reserving the stock from a different store or reserving the order for me and uh, having it shipped to my residence or to my office. So customers expect this. So, and of course, if you if the customer walks out of the door, there's no guarantee that he's going to go back and go to the next store to buy the same item. He might buy it from your competitor. So, the, so the whole uh, click and collect and reserve and collect both are clearly expectations there. And uh, from a convenience perspective, customers expect multiple payment options. They they would like to be able to use their credit card. They would like cash on delivery. They, they, would, uh, they would like to pay through a Paytm wallet or any other wallet there. So generally people expect the conveniences to be able to shop. And uh, allow me to change my mind. So this is again very interesting. I buy online, why should I not return it in the store? I, I go to a store, buy, buy a shirt, I find that it uh, doesn't suit me. Can I go to the store next to my house and return it? Is it possible? So these are expectations that customers have today. And uh, give my delivery fast. Don't charge me extra for the fast delivery. So, of course, when you look at uh, each of these items, so when you really, uh, what, what it tells you is that customers today expect a lot. Uh, customers are very comfortable shopping on the mobile. Uh, customers are uh, they're already tuned to shopping on marketplaces. How do you make sure that uh, you do all this as a retailer 
without uh, i mean it takes a lot of money to actually invest and uh, do all this how do you make sure that you are able to succeed so are there easy ways to make sure that the journey is successful that's one of the things which we wanted to cover and uh, one of the opportunities is to figure out if there are new revenue streams that uh, people can look at can can by collaborating with marketplaces and retailers is there an opportunity to unlock new revenue streams retailers and sellers uh, many of them are selling on marketplaces now one of the things people do is uh, by selling on marketplaces a you are creating online revenues and uh, b you are also testing out the operational challenges uh, which you would face while selling online means where are the customers buying from which are the locations you need to deliver how do you make sure that unit economics for delivery uh, is actually profitable are you i mean a lot of these things can be ironed out but in terms of the steps that you take so marketplaces can be um, um, don't have to be a competitor they can be uh, collaborators partners in the journey right so that's uh, that's essentially one of the things many retailers are seeing and asia actually interestingly has been a leader in this part uh, in this particular aspect when if you talk to retailers in us they they uh, most of them compete with the marketplaces but uh, asia india they are actually seeing that this could be very interesting of course one of the things i would ask the panelists as we go uh, uh, once the, uh, we move forward is to see which sectors are actually uh, seeing a lot of online uh, up, uh, uptake and what size of retailers uh, would possibly uh, do it on their own completely or is there some kind of a uh, yardstick for us to see who is better off starting off selling on marketplaces kind of question now the other thing that we are seeing is uh, stores as a fulfillment center for marketplaces this is something um, going back to the online to offline example that i spoke of um, we have uh, some very interesting examples in the industry where marketplaces are partnering with retailers and uh, they are using the stores of the retailers as a as a place to pick up uh, the item so for example i buy in a marketplace like ebay and i have the option to pick up the goods from um, many of the neighborhood stores uh, in which the item is available so ebay basically uh, works in collaboration with those retailers and may and uh, once um, if i say i would like to pick up from a particular store the order gets uh, sent out to the partner retailer who reserves the stock for me i just go and pick it up immediately so what are the advantages the marketplace is saving on the shipment cost uh, as a customer i get the item immediately uh, or uh, uh, very quickly and uh, for the retailer it's footfall and hopefully there will be additional revenue which is generated through the through the footfall grade so everybody stands to gain it's a win win for everyone of course there is some amount of competition which comes in because uh, of the fact that the customer is going into the retailer but if you are looking at strategic partnerships you everyone stands to gain so that's uh, again one of the things we would like to touch upon and uh, the whole opportunity of going international and particularly if retailers who own their um, uh, products or have distribution rights in different countries today technology is very uh, easily available um, to to go cross border means we have great examples in india where customers uh, like jaipur prayog uh, the many of them who are uh, attempting and succeeding in going online in uh, and selling in many countries uh, operating out of india itself. so um, theoretically there is no reason why you can't sell in a 60 to 70 plus countries means of course there's no limit to it you can you know, through using these cross border platforms so of course there it depends on the category of products it also uh, depends on uh, the profitability Uh, being there uh, along with the uh, customer's ability to pay the uh, products cost and and the shipment cost but there are enough categories which can go international so um, this applies for sellers this applies for online brands this applies for brick and mortar retailers so uh, we we would like to touch upon that as well as a part of what we are discussing so uh, the revenue streams these revenue streams can actually go back to help in terms of the investments you need to make in terms of people process and technology to get the or to go through the omni channel journey that's one of the holy grail that we would like to touch upon so uh, without much ado we'll jump into the use cases so um, when we look at the use cases the first one we uh, we wanted to speak was offline to online uh, winkulam uh, works uh, 
with a customer called Popular Bookstores, who are uh, leading bookstores in Singapore. They have operations in Malaysia and Indonesia as well. Uh, fundamentally, uh, Popular uh, has been a traditional uh, bookstore with uh, a number of stores. Uh, they are the market leader in uh, these in the in the Southeast Asian markets. Uh, they sell uh, school uh, books, stationery, CDs, audios, etc. Uh, you would think uh, when Amazon and Flipkart are examples, saying that this is the first category which can succeed on that. Now they they. Uh, wanted a mechanism where they could sell online. They could, uh, um, when they uh, from uh, they they wanted to be able to uh, offer uh, a consistent experience to customers in terms of being able to buy online and have it delivered to their store to their uh, residents or uh, being able to pick up from the store. Uh, they um, uh, popular uh, uh, hasn't. Uh, um, looked at selling in marketplaces as on date, but they are seriously considering that as well. But um, they are a beautiful example uh, in terms of um, enabling omnichannel. So all the things that I spoke about in terms of inventory lookups is possible here. Uh, you can buy online and return to the store if, uh, within a period of 30 days if you change your mind. Uh, you you, you uh, can go to a store and not find an item. The sales associate will look up the availability of inventory in other stores and reserve the item for you for you to go and pick it up. Uh, you can close the deal then and there with them and go and pick up in the other stores. Uh, you can have it shipped to your residence or you can have it shipped to a, um, any uh, geographical location. There are certain geographies that they define. Uh, within the geographical locations, anywhere if you want it to be delivered, they will do it free of cost. Um, you can buy it in one store, return in the other. So all the things that I spoke about, the idea is really that you're giving a very uh, beautiful experience to the customer and you're, you're making it very pleasurable for the customer to deal with. So uh, Popular is attempting each one of these. Uh, it's still early days for them. They're 18 months uh, into the journey. Uh, they've seen their online revenues uh, go from a single digit to double digit and they are aiming for uh, uh, the online revenues to uh, be on par with the offline revenues which is uh, 800 odd million dollars uh, over the next three to five years. So they're, they're looking at online very strategically and uh, they're making investments to make this successful. Uh, I will pass on to Niket to discuss about uh, the next use case that we have here. Niket. Thanks, Ankit. Uh, so Popular actually is a very good example of how an offline uh, you know, company, a bookstore is actually moved to online. You know, uh, That's essentially a B2C customer. You, know, you have a wider reach. Really people are looking for books, looking for buying. Granger, on the other hand, uh, provides a very different opportunity and, uh, you know, just giving a background about Granger, the company actually founded in 1927. Uh, it's, it's, it's a company in the US, uh, the annual turnover as per the last year estimates for $9.5 billion. Uh, Granger deals into MRO segment, you know, it's a B2B company, it's a B2B, you know, resource company, you can go buy industrial products from Granger. What Granger did was something uh, you know phenomenal, and they had witnessed a tremendous success in moving a journey from offline to online. So Granger has their stores, you know, just spread across uh, across US, and they have a pretty decent presence in other continents as well, including Europe. Uh, Granger uh, started a journey, you know, in 1997. They set up their own product catalog online. You know, it's pretty early for internet was in a recent stage at that time. You know, we didn't have a very big, big company at that, at that time, you know, but they just started their journey in 1997, bought the complete product catalog which houses more than a million products online. Okay. Currently, uh, their 41% uh, of the revenues that they are having are from online. And that is the kind of growth and that is the kind of business that they have built from moving from offline to online. But, uh, you know, the point that we need to, uh, you know, ensure and take care and also notice here is that it is not just movement of offline to online that actually helps them, you know, they have built an experience for a customer, you know, offline as well as online. So in every store where you go for Granger, you will have a, a you know, expert, uh, as you have an Apple expert, right? You have an expert, you can go there and say, okay, this is my company, this is the kind of work that I do, uh, suggest me a good number of products, you know. They will listen to you, they will understand you. those product exports will actually suggest because okay, this is the kind of product that you can buy. You know, once that is done, the purchase can happen offline, the purchase can happen, you know, online the person can go and can buy online. The repeat purchases, which is a very, very big aspect in the B2B businesses can happen either offline or online as per the customer's convenience. 
uh, even they have integrated the entire checkout experience. You know, whenever you go and buy a product on Ranger, you will get an option of either getting it delivered to your premise, you know, your factory, your house, uh, your shop, or you can actually pick it up from their own store. Okay, so as you can see in the slides, you know, you have a very decent option. As soon as you go for a checkout, you can enter the pin code where you want to, uh, you know, where you live. Uh, they will tell you the nearest store that is available. They will tell you whether the inventory is available or not. And if the inventory is available, uh, they will tell you by what date you can pick the product. Or if you want, you can get it delivered at your home or at your office. So uh, Granger is a pretty, pretty decent example to see how a successful transition from an offline to an online to, you know, uh, a, a, a experience that is built to the user, which ensures that, you know, everything has been taken care of. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Niket. So let me just uh, go to the next example here. Uh, marketplaces collaborating with retailers. So um, when there are any number of examples we can look here, uh, we, we, we are talking of uh, being able to sell on marketplaces for one. Uh, we, uh, uh, in the Indian context, can you think of a few retailers, Niket, who are selling on marketplaces? Uh I think we have to. Uh, Wildcraft well, itself uh, yeah. is one. Ravi yes. was talking yes. about that. Yeah, Triox sells on See, We have places. certain examples, you know, which have actually gone from open to marketplace. Like we have Zobi, we have improved, we had improved. You know, those are retailers, you know, which actually uh, pretty serious in our example. Those are brands actually which had their own stores. Uh, they, have, they have their own online presence, but they also started to sell on marketplaces. So, you know, start getting more and more orders. Correct. So, no, uh, uh, selling on marketplaces obviously is an added sales channel yeah. and that helps in terms of additional revenues which are coming yeah. So, there are any number of examples in the Indian context which we can see and it's been successfully done. People are selling, uh, for domestically people are selling on multiple marketplaces. But they're also selling in uh, um, other countries as well. So, when they do, Mabrao was a good example, that, but there are other people who have a real opportunity to go international by partnering with marketplaces in different countries. So, if you look at, for example, um, countries like Thailand, countries like Indonesia, uh, you, I mean, there are unique, uh, there are local marketplaces who are very successful. And there's a tarot.com, there's a wheelofshopping.com, there's a soup.com in the Middle East. Now, if, these are beautiful vehicles for you to uh, collaborate partner. So uh, this is a win-win for both parties. So marketplaces obviously would love to have retailers uh, come on board for them. And uh, retailers also have a low risk method to uh, get into newer sectors. Yeah, actually, it's, a, it, it's, an, it's an experience you know, that is good for both of the parties. You know? So definitely um, tying up with the marketplace enables the retailer to have an additional revenue channel you know, uh, they measure their footfalls, you know, in a particular location, the catchment area. As soon as they go online, they are actually looking at the eyeballs, with how many number of people that we are able to track. As far as for the marketplaces also that, uh, as you know, as you mentioned in the earlier slides, that, you know, uh, it opens up a fulfillment hub for the, for the, for the marketplace. Many times it happens that the customer doesn't want the order to be delivered to their house, you know, whether the service ability is not there, you know, the order cannot be delivered to their pin code or cannot be delivered to their office location, house location or they are not at house, you know, not at home to actually schedule a delivery. In this, in those places, you know, it's a, it's again a, a very beautiful relationship that can be found, right? You know, so tying up with the marketplaces, uh, a, a, a customer can select, okay, I want to place my order and I want to be delivered on this particular uh, showroom. As soon as it is done, uh, you know, that enables another walk-in for the customer on the retailer, you know, uh, and also it enables the marketplace to actually deliver to the customer and have a superior experience given. Uh, I think we have an example that is there. Uh, Let's go to that. Uh, this is the next one we were talking. Yes. So when we look at, uh, when this is the, this is a classic example of uh, how Argos yes. increase their revenues big time yep. after their partnership with the link. When this is something which uh, uh, is uh, a yes. case study for everyone to follow. Yes. So this is, uh, I, mean, I think, uh, I don't have exact stats with me, but I think Argos increased uh, more than 40% uh, of their so revenue after their as the reports, with the yes, As per the reports, uh, Argos, uh, one third of the revenue were from the click and collect. Okay. So they tied up with eBay to have an option of click and collect. So whenever a user, so Argos is a UK based company. 
Correct. So then kind of it, you can you be okay to have an option of okay, I want the order to be delivered at the Argos store. Okay. Uh, that have a two-way relationship for eBay and Argos. So the eBay sellers they could uh, you know pack their material and deliver it uh, in the Argos outlet. And then Argos can ensure that okay, they will be you know transferring to the nearest Argos outlet and maybe ensuring that that product and that order is delivered to the customer in 48 hours. As far as for the customers, since eBay allowed customers to select Argos as a point of fulfillment, you know that enabled uh, click and collect is the uh, you know word that they point. Right. So click and collect enables the Argos customers to actually uh, eBay customers to come to Argos. They collect their material and also have purchases done you know for additional thing that they want to buy. So it was a mutually beneficial relationship. They were able to increase the salaries. They were able to increase their customer reach by doing this uh, engagement. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So um, we, we also have the case of uh, uh, well, we, the cases which we spoke earlier, where primarily uh, how offline retailers have moved to online, and uh, how marketplaces have collaborated with offline retailers. Or when I'm, I'm calling them offline, more as a simplistic definition. Then when the retailers either are selling offline, people are selling online, or the online people are selling offline. But uh, just for differentiating, that's why I'm calling the brick and mortar retailers as the offline retailers. Okay. So uh, from a, a Nike perspective, Nike is well known, of course. So they're a leading online beauty retailer, and they started as a pure uh, uh, online retailer. They had more than four four hundred brands, and uh, they recently uh, raised. A round of funding, which was uh, primarily targeted at getting uh, the uh, getting Nike to set up uh, stores across the country. Now, uh, the interesting angle to this is obviously what Nike uh, has seen is that uh, uh, it is important for them to be able to be close to the customer. Now, this means, uh, um, of course, we'll come to the technology part of it, but in terms of uh, what Nike was uh, trying to do, uh, they, they clearly are a case of people moving uh, from online to offline. Uh, Nike did try working by collaborating with marketplaces. It's something which didn't work for them. So they, uh, it's not that uh, one formula works for everyone. Yes. But uh, uh, I guess they also were at a size where they could uh, attempt to do it themselves. So And they had already figured out succeeding online. So, so I guess uh, it's a slightly different use case there. Definitely. Okay. So then that, that brings me to a question there. What do you think are the categories which uh, are doing well online or where there is an uptake online? Do you want to uh, speak a bit and really chip in as well in terms of what you think? Which categories do you think are uh, succeeding in terms of online revenues? What, what, what kind of products? So, uh, uh, see, there are many categories, you know. So we have to see which categories are uh, the customer demand for, you know. So fashion is a very big category, you know. We have seen tremendous growth in mobile category, you know. The mobile flipper actually built on mobile and books. You know, books is another category that was very, very famous. Consumer uh, electronics is one. Yes. Bookstores is one. Yes. Uh, then health and beauty. Health and beauty, uh, yes. But I think there are some operational challenges of why that category hasn't really taken off. Right, because of the transportation of goods from one place to another, but definitely, uh, I think we have seen some traction in these categories as well. Cosmetics, yes, the same. It's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, but see, if we talk about Colexo's example, you know, we have seen a very, very good example, uh, you know, growth in terms of how the B2B markets have increased. You know, we have seen tremendous uptake in terms of safety products that have been sold online. We have seen a tremendous uptake in terms of what uh, you know, power tools and handles are sold. It's so amazing, isn't it? So, see, you you would say that the first step is cosmetics, health and beauty, bookstores, consumer electronics are, are in in my mind they are easy candidates. Okay, they'll they'll definitely uh, globally they succeed. Yeah, they are high margin um, items as well. Now, one of the one of the areas which has been attempted many times and so, some companies uh, are doing fairly well is grocery. Yeah, and it is amazing that uh, industrial equipment. Has succeeded in a big time, and uh, who would have thought that jewelry Indian consumers yes. will buy jewelry online, and that could be ticket items. So that so uh, well, I am very sanguine about the uh, whole case of e-commerce uh, succeeding. Ravi, do you want to comment a little bit on more, uh, whether uh, the fall in e-commerce revenues of in the last few months 
Is it a temporary phenomenon? What do you think? Are you able to hear us, Ravi? Yes, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, and uh, before that, I want to just say something else. I wanted to say that if you look at it, candidates to go online, I would put it down to three factors by and large. Uh, the number one is uh, any product or uh, any which will give the same experience to the consumer, whether the consumer buys it online or offline, is a likely candidate for going online. Number two, I would say, is the robustness of the product to withstand the uh, the the journey from a warehouse, from a store to the custom consumer's place because of the kind of logistic systems that we have in place. And number three would be a product uh, which, uh, in, in in a larger way, um, you know, uh, meets the affordability and the expectation of the consumer by uh, through peer reviews. So. Um, in my experience, uh, and that's why you know, the fashion and lifestyle industry, which we always felt would be one of the last to get into this bandwagon of online, is doing significantly well. For example, Wildcraft has about 20% of its revenues coming from uh, from online sales. So, so uh, no doubt about it. Um, online as a market, uh, I would say, is is a very good market. And what you see today is a temporary uh, blip, as I look at it because the freebies that were there erstwhile being promoted and a lot of these marketplaces have come off and so some of the sheen has worn off but in terms of the reach of an online uh, is always going to be much bigger and much wider than you would, what you find in a brick and mortar particularly when you want to expand into tier 2 and tier 3 cities in India and if like as you said in the past you know uh, having a base in India you want to go international without actually setting up offices so, so I I see this uh, uh, trend to continue and uh, online to be a key component of a sales strategy of any organization. And so that's clearly uh, there is no escape to the fact that customers want to want the convenience. So, we're, we're, uh, so we got to find profitable means to achieve it. So there's no question of uh, on, and that's my view. In terms of online. And online revenues will grow. Uh, you got to I mean, but uh, the days of freebies are gone. You got to figure out ways to cut the supply chain costs. You got to find ways to profitably grow. True. So, uh, uh, just coming back, uh, we'll come back to you, Ravin, and uh, some of the other things we wanted to talk about. This is just a uh, trend we are noticing. A lot of uh, consumer packaged goods. Uh, are selling on marketplaces. They are uh, also setting up portals to uh, figure out if, uh, as an additional sales channel, they are trying to reach customers. So, uh, I mean, it's self-explanatory, but it's an interesting trend. Uh, this is one of the uh, markets which always work through distributors and retailers alone. There's nothing for retailers or distributors to feel challenged. It is just an opportunity for some of these players to reach new markets where they are not present. So, I mean, there could be an African. Um, there could be a Vietnamese coffee maker who sells on a marketplace in uh, India or Malaysia uh, where they are not present or they don't have a partnership with the retailer. Uh, it could be um, uh, the, the African products which are not really, uh, they've not uh, got their due. They, they could figure out a method to uh, go into different uh, geographies using marketplaces. Um, so they, there are interesting trends there, of course, but what uh, the, in the bigger context of things, uh, I think Unilever, Tobleron, Colgate, Palmer, all these guys are looking at various ways to uh, tap into new territory. So I think that's also an interesting trend. So um, I know we're, we're running uh, short on time, so we will quickly go back to the uh, cases on uh, uh, both Nikkei. Um, maybe you you will we'll go with Ravi first. Yeah. So Ravi, why don't you take up uh, uh, very briefly the Fitbit example, and maybe you can continue with uh, the Wildcraft journey. I think there are a lot of interesting pointers there. Sure. Uh, 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 I'd like to talk about the Fitbit uh, to begin with. Uh, sure. You see, when Fitbit uh, wanted to enter India in the month in some in July 2015. While Fitbit uh, traditionally has been uh, selling through, uh, through retail modules uh, globally, it chose in India to, to have an exclusive tie-up with Amazon to sell it online first before it uh, moved on to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the retail space uh, through Reliance and Chroma, etc. 
so that itself gave us a, a sign that you know the, the, they saw a huge potential in uh, in uh, in the online reach uh, in terms of the ability uh, to reach out to more more consumers than uh, if they could see it only through the brick and mortar uh, uh, outlets but their long term strategy has been to sell on both modules and as you see today you you will go to a chroma or a reliance retail or a walmart or a staples you will find uh, uh, Fitbit products there, as well as you will find it online. So that's a very cl classical example of how uh, large companies, large product companies, have uh, you know adopted. Sorry, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. the uh, traditional the uh, traditional model, and as well as fitted in the online model into their way of uh, business. Now, now let me come to uh, Wildcraft, which is closer to my heart, where where I really have uh, done work. You know, when, when we started this journey uh, in Minecraft, uh, uh, we, uh, we by, by and large, we've been uh, 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 in the, uh, on the offline space, you know, we, we've got about 130 stores across the country. We are present in about 2,500 POS uh, through various uh, multi-brand uh, outlets. Uh, yet, as, uh, you know, as the company began to grow, you know, we started, uh, you know, we noticed that once we wanted to go uh, grow, our uh, consumer palettes across the geo began changing, and uh, there were different price elasticity points. Uh, and even within the same city, you know, uh, uh, different socioeconomic classes had different uh, price price elasticity in terms of their buying behavior. So we had to uh, come up, uh, widen our portfolio to address this need. Now, when we started widening the portfolio, the first challenge we had was uh, our stores were not big enough to uh, take care of this uh, uh, this widened portfolio, right? And because most of our stores across the country are 400, 500 square feet, uh, uh, retail uh, space is quite expensive, as you know. And uh, we had a couple of flagship stores at 1,000 square feet plus. So, so initially we started working on algorithms to how to have the right mix of EBOs at every EBO how to have something um, you know called as an ideal quantity it's also called as iq in this uh, in this parlance we had experts working on it and all that but um, we really couldn't make much headway you know we used to have uh, quite a lot of stockouts and it got further complicated when we started working with the mbos because they had their own buyer seller agreement and they would raise their purchase orders etc so so that's when you know we realized that we need to now look at moving online and we started uh, coming up as online as an alternate platform to sell. So what, what basically what we did was we came with our own website called wildcraft.in, which would largely cater to the uh, the the entire which would present the entire portfolio of Wildcraft products, uh, and would take care of the gaps in the stores, you know. And uh, then we started tying up with companies like Flipkart and Snapdeal, etc., and also with the marketplace players like eBay. Um, but over time, we found that that business is giving us significant traction. And uh, so we started developing the infrastructure to manage this business because I'll come to that briefly later. There are challenges in how do you manage this, right? And uh, as we started spending time on that, um, uh, we uh, we now have moved beyond that to say that how do we give a, what, what I call as the omni-channel experience. And that's the slide that I have presented uh, here uh, to the consumer. Wherein if I, uh, when I say omni-channel, the consumer gets the same experience irrespective of which store uh, or which uh, uh, multi-brand outlet or, or or if the consumer walks into a, um, a Wildcraft retail store or on the website. The experience should not be different. So one of the examples is a customer uh, walks into a store, uh, browses to our products and doesn't find the right uh, product. You know, the, the store uh, manager would then offer the consumer to say that, okay, um, you know, can I find out whether you uh, whether this product is available elsewhere or different size or a different color? What do you like? And uh, the consumer could actually browse through the uh, various uh, uh, products available in the catalog, and uh, could direct to where the which is the nearest store which which is talking this particular product, or could give an opportunity to uh, to place an order and get it delivered to your home, or place an order and deliver it to the nearest. Uh, retail store uh, closer to the consumer's house or the consumer could say she'll walk in and uh, uh, test uh, check it out here and then buy it you could reserve it so this is the model that we are working on you know uh, now while this requires uh, us uh, to have an infrastructure uh, in place and that's the 
the next slide that I'm talking about is on the strategic initiatives. The key infrastructure that we realized that one needs to do that is to first ensure that uh, you know we have in place a structure to directly ship to the end consumer. All right. Now, if you look at it, direct shipping of products from a warehouse to an end consumer is vastly different from shipping it uh, through the channels. Uh, you know, for about two to three reasons output. Number one is time. You know, the consumer expects the uh, delivery to be in within the same day or next day of making the buy, just like how she would have uh, experienced if she would have walked into a store, you know, it would almost be instantaneous uh, delivery. So uh, there's a need for speed. There's a need for quality. So, so uh, to explain that, you know, in most uh, retail stores, uh, the, the salesman would do one level of QC uh, after the products have reached and in case the product is a little bit crumpled or the packaging is a bit dirty, the salesman would keep it aside and only show the good pieces. In this case, the warehouse needs to do uh, that kind of one level check because it's too expensive to ship it and the consumer uh, returns it saying that the packaging is not good or the quality of the product doesn't look good or you know the product is crumpled because then you have to pay to and fro cost for shipping. So that is the other one. And the third one is obviously the option to pay cash on delivery. So the first thing that Wildcraft did was to create infrastructure to su support this by, by creating warehouses uh, near load centers, like high demand centers, you know. Uh, but that, there is a risk there also. You cannot spread yourself too thin because otherwise you will have your portfolio spread across various warehouses. So, uh, so there's a balance there to play. The next one, which is critical, is to deploy a multi-channel order management tool for aggregation. Now, so this is something where we have tied up with the uh, Vinculum for their Vinny retail. So that helps us uh, collect uh, demand from various uh, channels, aggregate it, and then um, um, uh, move it for uh, for pick pack, etc. Right. Uh, the third one is obviously to deploy uh, hyper local delivery systems. Uh, so because if you're going to do a store to store movement, you need to have some kind of hyper local uh, delivery systems to fulfill that. This last mile uh, delivery is very critical here. And the fourth one was uh, to realign the business module, uh, model of revenue. Now, this is a very critical software issue that we realized because we need to have a, both the store in which the order, the order or the, uh, the, the, the lead was generated and the store which fulfilled it or the warehouse which fulfilled it to have some share in, this, in the revenue. Otherwise, there is no buy-in of the store manager. So, so this was uh, something that uh, uh, Wildcraft uh, is working on to uh, go live with our uh, with our omni-channel experience. Uh, we have uh, started work uh, with Vinculum, and we kind of I think in the next three to six months we should have this deployed across the uh, the country uh, in terms of our uh, omni-channel experience. Yeah, uh, Venkat, that's all from me. Th thanks, thanks. Uh, that was quite insightful. Uh, quick questions in terms of one or two questions there. Well, do you uh, partner with uh, third party logistics companies uh, in terms of deliveries or predominantly it's done in house? We do partner with third party logistics companies in, uh, to, uh, to have our deliveries uh, uh, because there is a con concept of uh, local deliveries which is geo specific and, and we do not have that expertise and neither is RB in this business. And uh, we have seen across the country there is various third-party logistics who have expertise in, in certain uh, segments better than in others. So, so obviously the integrations with all the logistics companies, etc., from a tech perspective, also is quite critical. It's very, very important because the consumer needs to know what happened to the order, where is the order once his order is placed, right? So uh, one can't increase the anxiety levels of the consumer by asking the consumer to wait for six or seven days before the material reaches. The consumer would like to know. From the time the order is placed and the money is given, or even if it's a COD, what happened to the order? When is it expected? When is the person out for delivery? And that needs to be tied up with the uh, with the supplier, with the retailer's uh, system, so the retailer is able to track the status of the order and uh, review it with the logistic service provider. So this integration is also equally key. You know, possibly, uh, possibly by the minutes, people want to see when it is coming by the minute rather than yes. by days. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's, so that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Ravi. So uh, I'll come back to you for, for other questions. Uh, um, we'll, we'll quickly move to Nikhil. I know we're running late, but let's uh, cover Tulex so in terms of what you have seen, what are the experience that you have seen, and what does Tulex do to doing to improve the customer experience? 
So, uh, so when Tobex so entered this entire ecosystem of e-commerce, that to a B2B space, you know, we were the first ones to actually, you know, uh, go there and talk to the seller, to go there and talk to people that yes, you can actually buy these products online. Right, so uh, these are predominantly offline sellers. They are predominantly offline sellers. You know, they, they are certain hubs. You know, there are certain digital hubs. You know, we have Tavri Bazaar, we have Tavri Chowk in Delhi. You know, we have some places in like Bangalore, we have in Mumbai. You know, there are certain digital hubs where there is a lot of concentration of these, you know, sellers. You know, uh, so they 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 are authorized of various brands. You know, they have to, they sell from their localized market and you know cover a region of say Delhi, Delhi, NCR, or Mumbai, or Mecca, Maharashtra, right? So it was the very first thing that we start, uh, tried to do uh, was you know to convince those sellers that there is a lot of value when you come online and start selling online, right? You can actually increase your reach, you can increase uh, you know your revenue, you can increase your sales. You know it, it's it's a win-win situation. You know with, with a very minuscule effort or an incremental effort that you have to put from your end, you you can able uh, you will be able to get a lot of returns out of it. Uh, so, so that was one of the biggest challenge that we have faced, you know, while uh, while building products. So second thing is to ensuring of a customer experience, and uh, that is also very very important, especially when the sellers are not that well trained. The sellers are very new to the entire market. How many sellers uh, do this collection have? So we have uh, more than seven thousand sellers that are there with us right now. Okay, and predominantly or offline. Yeah, predominantly or offline. Uh, some of the sellers are there on the marketplaces, but the major categories on on which we are dealing with, they are the you know single seller sector. So, uh, so you're talking about experience, uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, for the customer, you know, there are four things that we actually pay a very, very high importance to: is the availability of the product, you know, uh, also the price, you know, we are giving the right price for the product. Uh, then we also say the service that we are able to give them and the convenience. These are four pillars where we say that okay, if the customer is able to, you know, have a satisfaction, all these four pillars: price, you know, service, convenience, and availability. And availability. Okay. So, so availability is just that the product that the customer is looking for has to be available there. You know, convenience is how easy it is or how difficult it is for product. Uh, change the Okay, continue, please. Yeah. So, how easy it is or how difficult it is for the customer to actually, you know, search for a product. You know, then it comes down to the price. You know, whether we are able to give him the correct price that he is getting, you know, it has to be competitive. I'm not saying they've been undercut the price so that the person only comes for the price value, but his price has to be correct for the customer to actually come and you know, invest into us. Uh, and the last thing, service. You know, once the order has been placed, we have to deliver a superior service for the customer. You know, as since the time the order has been placed to the time order has been delivered, and even post delivery, you know, uh, return or anything that issue that the customer faces in the products. We really need to ensure that everything has been taken care of. So, you know, those are some of the challenges that we really face. Uh, you know, what we have done uh, for this, you know, we we have started to build uh, certain regional hubs. You know, that in collaboration with uh, So we have increased the reach of a seller from a localized market to a national market. You know? So we have sellers who are stocking their material in their own warehouse. We have people who are stocking their uh, in, in our warehouse. Then they are now stocking their material in. Uh, like, uh, in in Bangalore in Mumbai they are now stocking their material right so the people the person who was shipping from Delhi is now serving customers uh, from Mumbai uh, and you know customers of Mumbai so by this we are able to ensure that the reach of the sellers have increased and we are able to deliver uh, give a superior service to our customer you know our person mm -hmm. is buying a product and if it's a localized customer you know we are able to deliver him in a day or two so that gives a superior experience you know sticking us started again uh, for seller as well as for us. Another thing that we have, uh, you know, launched uh, in some time back was Tulipso Speedy. That essentially uh, means that whatever you buy from us will be in a superior quality, and that will be delivered to you as soon as possible. You know, we'll commit a 24-hour dispatch and then the delivery uh, for the customer. Tulipso Speedy uh, was an initiative that we took to, uh, to, you know, commit to our customers and say, okay, uh, we will give, deliver the right product. You know, you can trust on us. We will deliver the right product at the right time. Right, so that is something that we try to do. Uh, in another challenge that I had mentioned you was you know training of sellers. You know, many of the sellers are not uh, you know savvy with technology, and uh, many of the sellers are not uh, you know very very. Uh, so how do you, how do you do it? You do multiple sessions, and you made it easy to download videos. What are the steps? So uh, there is a multi uh, you know channel sort of an approach that we have done. So we do have certain training video that we have done. Uh, there is a complete seller onboarding program that we have built. You know that starts with an onboarding or registering of a seller to the time the first order has been processed by the seller. 
So there is a hand holding done at each and every stage, you know, to ensure the seller is able to maintain, uh, understand what the internet ecosystem is, you know, what the e-commerce ecosystem is, and seller is able to fulfill the order that he is getting in time. You know, because uh, if he is not fulfilling, that's a loss for him and a loss for us. You know, we have also heavily invested on building our own seller panel. You know, that has built keeping in mind the B two B specifics. Right. Do you allow uh, pickup from I mean, some of your sellers have stores of their own? Right? Yes. So do you allow pickup of the orders from the stores? Uh, by the customers? By the customers? No, not yet. It's something that we have not tried yet. Okay. What we are actually trying to do is to build an experience store. You know. Okay. So so as uh, you know, we also mentioned. You know, uh, we are building in. Uh, we are trying to build experience stores across industrial clusters to see for our customers to actually go. And experience the product. You know, there is a local brand that is very good in Delhi, very famous in Delhi. But I am not sure how many people know about it in a small industrial cluster in Delhi. Right. Mm -hmm. So such industrial clusters, experience stores will actually help us, uh, help our customers to actually experience the product, see their quality, and then place an order for us. That is also something that we are trying to do to overcome a challenge of convenience and you know the availability out of it. So we have a, a customer called Rolali in Indonesia, towards in a similar space. Mm -hmm. now they they uh, have a number of uh, sellers who have small stores, yeah. or three stores, five stores, kind of thing. So they, they tried the pick up from the store kind of a model and they done it very interestingly, very successful. This is in Indonesia. So they, they, they use our entire stack. Mm -hmm. So they use our management, they use our seller panel. And also sure. cataloging the data, data system, but uh, it's quite an interesting experience with that. So uh, I'll, I'll come back again, and yeah. thanks for those inputs. Uh, so I, I, we're running late on time, I'm not going to spend too much time on the changes in the uh, IT landscape, but what is critical here is, uh, if you look at from a retailer perspective, you are, uh, look, some of the key elements that we are talking about here is a, a order management system which can piggyback, integrate with the ERP systems and the store systems and is able to manage the online orders well. That's a critical piece of investment that will need to be made. And uh, like what we have seen with Wildcraft, uh, integration with marketplaces and integration with three fields is a critical piece. And uh, um, in, I, mean, I, I would say those are the main elements from a retailer perspective. Uh, if we Go in from an online brand perspective, uh, you still will uh, have those elements, order management system and uh, getting your supply chain uh, in a good shape. Now, what in addition could be is if the online brands are setting up small stores and kiosks, there would be the need for a cloud post. And interestingly, both players, you would find uh, integration to cross-border platforms as a critical uh, piece for, for many of them to go international. So you would uh, want your uh, uh, product of uh, partners to have integration to cross-border platforms. Uh, both retailers and uh, online brands, anything that you're trying in the o attempting the O2O journey, uh, the real-time update of inventory, uh, real-time view of inventory is going to be quite critical. So uh, if, you're, if you're going to say pick up from store, uh, you need to make sure that you have uh, Near uh, real time update of inventory from the store. Otherwise, I will. will so, you want to talk about that, Ravi? Yeah, yeah. Um, I will just uh, quickly uh, highlight some of the critical things in this. Um, real time inventory update is key to ensuring consumer satisfaction. There is no two things about it because multiple players will be seeing the same inventory the stores, the marketplace, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the customer, the in, or inventory should get blocked as soon as the order is booked or reserved. That's the first critical thing. The other thing that is critical would be the system should be robust enough to take orders from multiple uh, uh, channels and block it all at one go. You know, obviously, at a business level, you may need to set priorities in terms of whether it has to be your own website, followed by store, etc. But this, uh, this entire, the, there should be a very strong IT platform which can, uh, uh, which can do this aggregation for you in real time. And it should be able to optimize the time to serve. And that's a very critical thing, you know, because you may have a store which is nearby, which is just about two kilometers away, versus a store which is 15 kilometers away. But the pin code to service of that store is, is much more better than the one that is two kilometers away. Then the, the system should be able to figure out based on the, uh, the algorithm set, which is the right place to pick up the inventory from. 
So I would say that these these are the couple of things that uh, is critical uh, uh, when you're doing this when you're doing the O2O journey. Thanks, Ravi. Well, that's uh, so uh, we we have some additional information here, but uh, order fulfillment by three PLs. Uh, I guess when it's, it comes back to the same pointers here, the order management system, integration to 3PLs and uh, integration to marketplaces, real-time view of inventory. Uh, these are critical towards enabling the O2O journey. So uh, with that, you know, means the transform IT landscape will look something like this, but I think with uh, time not being on our side, I'm rushing through a little bit here. But, but what is interesting, then I'll just take you back to the slide I started with for a second, right? So if uh, um, I'm, I'm just scoring a few brownies here, Ravi, if you allow me, yeah? So, so that what Winkulum does, right, means if you go back to the fundamental thing that we are doing, that's essentially uh, to be able to uh, offer products on the cloud which use integrations to web stores, which use integrations to multiple channels, which use integrations to uh, three uh, fulfillment companies and uh, which essentially means I was just um, going off the track here that's why I had to go back but if you look at the pieces there integrations to multiple channels integrations to 3PLs real-time view of inventory uh, and integration to cross-border platforms is the powerful integration layer that we have built on top of which all of these different elements are uh, all, all the different products have been created and then the order management piece the 3PL, um, then the uh, warehousing piece, the uh, product to onboard sellers, there's a seller panel, uh, there's a PIM product which is created to keep the data consistent. If you really look at each of these elements, lean on the same integration layer. And uh, what we have done is to create a stack which uh, uh, helps in the O2O journey. So, uh, but, but if we go back, right, then so what are the learnings for us? So if we were to create a cheat sheet in terms of uh, what is useful for uh, customers to go on the O2O journey. So should we say the first step, would it be useful uh, to say that uh, selling on marketplaces is a simple and easy way to uh, get online revenues? Would that apply for uh, retailers and online brands of all sizes? What do you think, Ravi? What's your view on that? Uh, uh, see, there is no uh, no simple straight answer, uh, but uh, the way I would look at it is any uh, online, uh, any retailer which wants to increase geo presence uh, uh, without spending too much on the infrastructure to build it up should look at online as a very uh, complementary solution uh, to the to the entire experience for the consumer. Uh, having said that, uh, I would say that uh, uh, one would need a warehouse infrastructure to support tick pack and ship operations like I mentioned earlier, so that is going to be critical. Uh, one would need a, a strong uh, ERP uh, and a strong uh, enabler uh, like a Winnie Retail to, to link the ERP with the, with the marketplace so that one would need to invest in that and one would need to invest in last mile delivery systems. So any organization uh, which believes that uh, a significant portion of this revenue can be unlocked by, by going online should look at it. And when I say significant, I would say even at 10 to 15 percent is a pretty good number to look at. You know, uh, the the incremental costs of setting up uh, uh, infrastructure would would uh, would uh, would easily pay off over a period of maybe a year year and a half at max. That's the way I look at it. So uh, uh, going back to that question, means is there a particular size of retailers you think should uh, uh, definitely consider looking at uh, marketplaces as an ally? What yeah, anyone think? which has. Sorry, uh, Ravi, you yeah. have. My way, any, anyone, any company which has turnover of 50 crore plus should look at it. No doubt, no two things about it. I, I think it should be open for everyone. Even a small retailer should be, you know, as I you know, earlier mentioned, you know, the incremental cost of going on a marketplace is very, very less. You know, so I think it reduces the cost of getting things wrong in the first place. Yeah. Operationally, you can clean so up things. You, can you, 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 you basically get your operational strategies clean. And you have a, the cost of making a mistake is small here. Yeah. So and, and hopefully, you will actually uh, get a lot of revenues going through this model. Yeah. So this is one. Right. So, uh, uh, in terms of uh, let's let's take other uh, cheat sheet questions. Let's take 
each of these candidates sellers let's say what what would you uh, what you would you advise sellers so i will advise sellers you know to start exploring online as a very very lucrative opportunity you know that doesn't matter what products you sell you know i am sure that whatever you sell there is a marketplace that is selling that you know they will do the marketing for you they will do all the fulfillment for you all your so sellers do. should sell on multiple marketplaces and should should be able to manage their orders from uh, selling uh, from a single location easily yes, yes. so uh, sellers should collaborate with retailers definitely okay now uh, if you right. take online brands what would be the recommendation so online brands uh, again you know for online brands there should be a you know a uh, synergy between what they wanted to offline also and all, what they wanted to online because you know we believe offline uh, offline sales offline you know presence can actually help in transition and uh, awareness which can help in online uh, conversion as well okay then do you want to add something there uh, ravi in terms of pure online brands what would be the quick quick cheat sheet recommendations that you will give i i would i would say that uh, any online brand should definitely look at uh, uh, the at a retail uh, module for complementing its uh, its presence you know because uh, retail uh, having a brick and mortar structure does give you that the consumer also an opportunity to touch and feel products because some, something that is critical you know so i would say that everyone uh, the experience now we are so to collaborate with retailers in terms of creating the touch points or they should have small stores or kiosks which is what is a trend we are uh, observing as well correct uh, yeah yes yes and collaboration seems to be the key here because there is a cost of setting up infrastructure obviously so it's correct. always better to to collaborate rather than set up your own infrastructure because you may not get it right in the first place or it may not be at a particular high street or something so it's always better to look at collaboration over uh, setting up your own uh, infrastructure is what i would believe and and for retailers uh, also you see the collaboration with marketplaces as an opportunity to get things right it also is a potential uh, collaborating with online brands maybe there could be an opportunity to sell more right definitely so, uh, and the again, current trend shows it right? yeah and the current trend shows it so uh, you you look at gillette you look at nestle if you look at any, even even uh, companies which sells like like gillette which sells the blades has uh, gone uh, as collaborated with the uh, online uh, retailers to sell wildcraft for example you know we we have uh, tied up with the with a plethora of online uh, retailers to sell and uh, there is absolutely no feeling that there is something like a competition between the two it's it all seems to uh, work for the for the growth of the brand itself so so i would say even retailers should not see that as a as a as a concern it will just be it is just complimentary so, uh, we can possibly uh, stop with that and maybe take uh, some questions from the audience if there is any at this point first question is how can a customer ensure that he has not received a counterfeit goods when buying online the issue of a counterfeit product generally becomes known only when the product is taken for service in the company service center and not at the time of purchase this is a question asked by sunita thank you for that uh, Ravi, do you want to answer that? How do you, how do you ha handle it if a customer? How do you make sure that the customer has not received a counterfeit good? So, uh, so the first thing uh, that uh, that would need is actually in this would be more of a customer awareness that even when when you are looking at uh, online retailing, there are authorized uh, sellers, you know, uh, or there are assurances given by the online uh, marketplaces saying that this is either fulfilled by Amazon. or uh, flipkart advantage etc so these are the options that uh, uh, i would as a consumer look at when i make the buy so just like when you buy uh, uh, from an from a brick and mortar you would go and buy from someone whom you would consider authorized one should look at those kind of tags on the online marketplace before you make a buy uh, because at the end of the day it's all a marketplace and you would find even in the brick and mortar industry uh, you do see a couple of uh, uh, you know retail shop which would sell fraudulent products so so that's that's very common so so the consumer does exercise some judgment when you go to a shop to know who is the right shop a uh, similar uh, assessment has to be done by looking at uh, the assurances given by the marketplace thanks ravi mean uh, have i answered the question uh, i'd like to know if have i answered sunita's question correctly or 
I think I can just add on top of it, uh, Sunita's uh, query is that, you know, if you ever find, uh, I think, uh, as an ethical practice for uh, a marketplace and as well as, uh, you know, for the seller, it is supposed to be a right product that is being sold. Right? In any given case, uh, if you find any product that is not, uh, you know, uh, genuine, you know, I think you should report to the marketplace. I'm pretty sure that every marketplace, you know, uh, Will will take care of it. You know, they may replace Some of the consumers uh, find that every marketplace has not uh, responded immediately positive. So there are stories out yes. there. So I think that's where the question is coming from. That's that's true. But you know, that is something that that differentiates the marketplace as well. See, there are other things. Absolutely. You know, there is some rating. There are product reviews that you see. You know, there are seller rating that are specifically mentioned. You know, so they have to be informed by you know, as we mentioned that if you're buying from a uh, you know, online retailer. You have to be sure that looking at buying a correct place. So the the next question was share an example of an Indian company which has gone offline to online. I think Bycraft is the example itself. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think they asked you. Yeah. Uh, uh, twelve like percent of our revenues and counting. <laughs> how, how can sellers plan their purchase and put a proper price for their products? Do you want to take that a bit? Yeah. So. Um, so there are different tools that are available, you know, that can help you do that. Uh, one of the things that marketplaces uh, we try to do is, you know, so you you actually get to know what is the price at which you are selling, what is the price that different sellers are selling. Right? You have to see a profitability definitely on top of it, but you have to be competitive in the market. You cannot be so high that you know you will never get the buy button on the top reference from the uh, from, from the marketplace. You have to be ensure that you are not so low that you are not not making any profit, and you have to. Uh, shut down uh, the online presence soon enough. So there are multiple. So I'm pretty sure the marketplace that you will try to work with, they will assist you in what is the right price. You know how much inventory and the forecasting that they're doing for the sales that they can expect for the quarter, for a month, for a week, and they can actually assist you in doing everything that you are asking. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question uh, is is star is for Raleigh. You mentioned bricks and mortar stores creating an online presence. But I seldom see them being connected. Why aren't the retail stores creating a user profile so that when the same user comes online, they can uh, they have a single view of the customer essentially. They can suggest things based on what has been purchased from the physical store. Why is it still broken? Yeah, that's 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 an interesting very, question. Very, very interesting question, and this is something that even at Minecraft we've been uh, grappling with for some time is uh, how to use multiple uh, uh, multiple inputs like like if someone uh, checks on a wildcraft product through facebook and uh, and the same person uh, uses youtube through a different login id and the person walks into a store how do we link all these profiles to to get an image of the consumer and that's 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 big business today in fact there are companies which are now retailing products around that as as, as to how to how to capture all these various pipes of which the, uh, the consumer is feeding information and to create a single profile. Uh, having said that, uh, as of now, um, uh, not many companies are successful uh, because of the challenges around technology and around integrating and some amount of privacy challenges also. But yes, this is a journey that uh, most retailers, even and, for, and not just retailers, even the online marketplaces are looking at as a next step of migration is to be able to track the consumer as the consumer flits across various web pages or as the consumer walks by the store. So there are some technology advances there also where uh, the Wi-Fi signal of the consumer can be used to capture the consumer uh, signature and hence uh, give information, etc. So I think uh, we probably are a couple of years away from us being uh, having a robust system around that. But uh, the intent is there to get, it, to, get to do that. So, I mean, the, the uh, real successful omni-channel retailers uh, do invest in making sure they have a consistent view of the customer. And it's a very critical parameter for omni-channel retailing anyway. When they absolutely. absolutely. I mean, there's right. no two thoughts about it. But, of course, all of this, uh, it's in the journey. I mean, all of these require investments. And you have to find ways to profitably do that. You have to be there for the long haul. Because online is not a quick way to make money. <laughs> That's true. That's right. That's right. So uh, let's uh, just go to the next question. Um, and I don't know if I can go through every question here, but there are quite a few questions. For a medium-sized retailer wishing to capture new sources of revenue, do you think they should go on their own 
or they should tie up with an established marketplace? Uh, I would like to take. So uh, I think it's a very clear answer. I think all three of us want to take this question. <laughs> has to be marketplace, right? Uh, so the one of the <laughs> so the biggest issue yeah. of uh, going online is to getting the cash spent rightly. So how will a user identify that you are online and you are going there for a purchase? You can't just keep on giving flyers to everyone that is walking into a store. Right? You have the entire uh, internet. See, I think the question comes from uh, some of the people, right? And some of the marketplaces are very restrictive in their partnership models. They say that you have to put your entire catalog here. You have to work uh, exclusively with us in some cases. So, you know, then uh, what is the right thing for the medium sized retailer? They have to identify the right marketplace yes, yes, yes. As, a, as a collaboration. Then yeah. you can't obviously, uh, if you are somebody who is building your own brand, yeah. you, you got to figure out a way that you are not boxed into a relationship which is. Too crowded and without yes. space, free, right? Yep. So, but if you find the right partner, I think partnering with marketplaces is a very effective way to grow, and that's again, that's my view. We can. So, Ravi, do you want to add to that? And as a retailer, uh, there has to be uh, um, you know some credibility that you wouldn't want to bring also onto the table. Uh, the the marketplace would want to be sure, just like it just answers the question that was asked about some three questions back. You know, how do how do you not get into uh, the retailers using that platform to sell counterfeit products, right? Ravi, let me continue there. What you're saying is that the marketplace has to make sure that the retailer is producing good quality products, and at the same time, the retailer has to make sure that the marketplace is someone he can collaborate with, right? So that mutually. It, it it works as a strategic or a good partnership. As long as that is there, that is a very effective way to grow your online revenues. Is that is that fair? That's exactly what you are trying to say. That's right. That's right. Okay, thank you. Now I'll go to the next question there. Uh, how does Tolexo man manage their returns? Do you have a seller quality policy? Yeah, uh, we do have a seller quality policy. As a matter of fact, you know, we we straight away disable the entire catalog of the seller. You know, if we find any you know uh, quality issues uh, reported by the customers, or if we do our own internal audits, uh, we straight away disable the seller till the time the issues are corrected. As for the return policies, you can connect us. Uh, you know, call center. You can connect a support desk, and I think they will assist you in uh, you know processing returns. Uh, you know, whatsoever the case, we have certain policy of three days of returns uh, on products. You can avail that if you want. Find the product is not up to the mark, or if you don't feel the product to be as what you expect it to be. So let me cherry pick some questions because we are uh, definitely over the time now. Um, there are questions uh, which is for Nikhil. How is Tolexo ensuring it stays ahead of competition? I won't name the competition because they are our customers too. <laughs> so it's 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 very simple, right? So we don't want to uh, get into the price wars, you know, selling this, you know, the lowest product, getting discounts, you know, spreading coupons. Uh, the success for us is uh, giving a superior experience to the customer. If they are able to experience, uh, get a very good experience of the product, if they are able to get a very good experience of all the touch points where we connect with them, uh, you know, we expect them to be, you know. Stick with us, even if we are a little bit costlier or we we are at par. You know, we want customers to have and come online experiences and you know stay with us. Uh, you know, that is our motto. You know, superior customer. So, in your in your uh, personal experience, what is more preferred to handle returns? A centralized return processing center or a decentralized network? Ravi, you want to try that? Uh, see the 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 key thing is. Uh, is that the consumer who's returning the product needs to be uh, refunded the amount as soon as possible, right? So um, whether to centralize it or decentralize it would largely depend on the organization's policies as to when the refund is initiated. Uh, if you if you were to ask me, uh, uh, that option should be uh, should be left to uh, the organization to decide. Uh, basis its uh, its risk assessment of how much of the returns. Are genuine and how much of the returns are fraudulent? Uh, large companies, and let me quote an example of Amazon, initiates returns the uh, refund the moment the return is picked up from the consumer's uh, house and doesn't even wait for the material to reach the uh, the where, the warehouse. So at that place, a centralized or decentralized warehouse would not matter. 
maybe the centralized warehouse would be used more for uh, uh, for the uh, for the reprocessing of the returns, but not for the refunds. I, I think from a consumer's perspective, uh, the key is how quickly are you refunding the uh, the, the money, and uh, and that is what uh, you know uh, retailers and uh, marketplaces should focus on. Okay. Now there are some questions with respect to process of getting new food products into online market. I'm not sure if either of the panelists is the right person to answer that. So sorry, Vivek, uh, Surana, we, we are not going to take that question. Um, let me look at other questions here. Yeah, maybe one last question before we wind up for the day. Uh, let's go here. What is the strategy to minimize the impact of discount coupons on the revenues of marketplaces and sellers since it's become a trend of for online marketplaces where, uh, with steep competition among retailers? I'm not sure if you understand the question. But uh, what is the strategy to minimize the impact of discount coupons on the revenue of marketplaces sellers? Is that clear, Ravi? Yeah. Uh, so let me just uh, give you. Uh, I mean, uh, because the strategy would vary from organization to organization. I would just tell you how what Wildcraft has done. Uh, we have adopted a very transparent pricing policy, saying that uh, the price that we will sell, whether it's online or offline, will be consistent and uniform, so that a consumer does not feel cheated. When the consumer walks into one one more of buying vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other one, I guess uh, in the long run, most organizations should look at how do you have a uh, uniform pricing policy, uh, irrespective of, of the mode on which the consumer is doing the buying. Obviously, uh, we are in the transition journey as wherein a lot of the marketplaces are trying to build a consumer base, and they would offer additional discounts on their own without even the uh, retailer like us wanting to offer it. But I guess. Yes, all this, as as the current trends itself are showing, is showing that these 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 freebies are wearing off, and you wouldn't see this uh, over a period of time. In fact, I recollect uh, I'm a I'm an ardent user of Ola cabs for traveling. Uh, when the Ola began its journey about uh, a couple of years ago, almost every trip was either a subsidized trip or a free trip. But now there is surge pricing. Now the number of discounted coupons are coming down. So as the uh, as the uh, the 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 marketplaces are getting establishing for themselves, they will start reducing these discount coupons. Retailers, I say, uh, do not need to do that as long as they give the consumer the right product and the right experience. Thank you, Ravi. I think uh, we've had some great questions there. Thank, I thank uh, ET Retail for facilitating this webinar. And I th thank Ravi and Nikhil for joining me today. And all the audience for patiently sitting through the 90 minutes. We've gone through, we've extended our time, but thank you very much. I hope. You found it as use, uh, useful and as entertaining as it was for the panelists. Thank you very much.